Hello everyone. We're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with another of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bells so that you can be sure not to miss any of our future videos. Today, we'll consider 10 ways to maximize your Bible study. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul explains three vital facts. All Scripture is inspired or God-breathed. All Scripture is profitable, positively and negatively, for faith and practice. And all Scripture is necessary to equip us for every good work. So I guess we'd better know about it, so we can live it. Here's the first step in the process. Just do it. Have a set time for study is our number one on the list. Some people work better in the morning, some people in the evening. Some people can do it in 20-minute segments. Somebody has to take a three-hour chunk on Sunday afternoon or Saturday morning. But whatever the case is, experiment a bit and then commit to a certain practice, a regular way of doing your Bible study. And a good way to help with that is our number two, get organized. Keep your supplies in one place. Bible study shouldn't be like a scavenger hunt where we have to go running around looking for pens and papers and books and so on. If you don't have the luxury of a desk, an office, at least a briefcase, you can keep your books open, you can have everything there so that when you do sit down to study, you can get right at it and not waste a lot of time running around. And probably in that organization, number three, have rough note paper and finished notes. You want to be able to try various things and theories and so on without messing up your finished notes, but at the same time, you don't want to leave everything rough. You want to uh, capitalize on what you've learned so you can use it again. And what I suggest is getting a loose leaf notebook, the paper about the size of your Bible, so that you can take the notes out, your finished notes, and take them with you if you have an opportunity to speak somewhere. So both are necessary and we want to make the most of our Bible study time. So let's not lose scraps of paper here and there or just stuff them in the back of our Bible. It's good to have a notebook with your notes in order. Good. And number four, you may find cross-reference notes helpful in your Bible. So instead of your own notes, now we're looking at the notes in the Bible. Obviously, a Bible with a little wider margin is helpful here, but the method that I've used that I found very helpful is on your first reference, you have the next reference placed there. So at Romans 3.23, you will have the next reference given to you. When you get further into the chain, then you will not only have the reference that you're referring to and the next reference, but you'll have the first reference in the chain. So wherever you're looking in your Bible, when you find that, you'll immediately be able to go back to the first reference and start where it originally is. So, you know, the more we can capitalize on what we've learned, the more we can share it with others. I remember Peter Pell used to say that whatever you learn, share it five times. If you give it away five times, you'll have it forever. If we learn something and then we don't utilize it, we're going to end up losing it. So it's important for us to pass on the blessing because, first of all, it forces us to be articulate and not simply say, oh, that was a nice chapter, but to tell us why. Secondly, it's a safeguard against error. If somebody tells us something that, mm, I'm not sure that's really in the Bible, we can have a safeguard there. And thirdly, it, it shares the blessing so that other people can enjoy the fruits of my labor as well. And I found that very helpful, the process of you've got your rough notes and then your finished notes and then what you had there of what I'm actually adding in my Bible. And it's kind of that next step of I'm sharing this, I'm giving it away, and I want that more finalized version. Right, right. So you're getting equipped to be used. 
use your tools wisely, use your time wisely. Good, and with that, uh, number five, get familiar with Bible tools. <laughs> right, uh, there are some handy books that students from previous generations have made available to us. W.E. Vine's Dictionary of Bible Words is invaluable because as we learn very quickly when we begin to study the scriptures, the English words don't always match the Greek words as we understand them. Sometimes there are subtle differences between different expressions of the same word. So having a Bible dictionary is helpful for that, but also a concordance. And of course, a lot of it is now available on software so that we can actually use our computers to do word searches, phrase searches, and so on, that this whole generation has been so enriched with resources that are available, there's really no excuse. Of course, Bible atlases and handbooks, which give us background about people like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, or the Philistines, or whoever it may be we're studying, it's good to have a good, like a Haley's Bible handbook or something like that as well. Number six is an essential for Bible study, and that is to pray before, during, and after. There are three big reasons that we ought to always keep praying, and one is so that we see the truth, and secondly is so that we understand the application of that truth to our lives, and third, that we have the courage and the willingness to obey it and put it into our lives. I have a little old tract by George Mueller. It's simply called First. And he talks about the idea that in the morning, the first thing I need to do is to get my soul happy in the Lord's presence. And the way he found most helpful was to, first of all, ask the Lord for his guidance and direction from the Word, and then to begin to read the Scripture. And he said it wasn't long as he thoughtfully read the Scripture that he was called on to make confession for something that was not in line with the scripture, or maybe an expression of thanksgiving or praise for some glorious truth there. Whatever it might be, maybe a intercession for someone. As he's reading a verse, he thinks, here's someone who needs that today, someone who's going through a hard time. So he found that he could simply pray up the scripture and that it was impossible really for him not to get his soul happy by reading the scriptures and then praying it up in various forms, whether thanksgiving or praise or intercession or supplication or worship. And I think that's a, that's a great thing that our, that our Bible study is also absorbed by prayer so that it's a two-way conversation between us and the Lord and not just us trying to discover the meaning of the Bible on our own. And number seven, analyze the details. Again, when we're reading the Bible, in some ways we read it like any ordinary book. It has sentences and subjects and verbs and so on, descriptive terms. On the other hand, it's a supernatural book. And so while we need the Lord's help, we also need to be orderly and methodical in the way we look at it. We should be looking for the main theme. If we can find the main theme, then everything else in the chapter will be tributaries that flow into that main theme. We should also be looking for key words. Now, key words may be repeated words or they may be technical words like justification or glory. And then we also want to see the thought flow. Why does this follow that verse? How does the context help me understand each verse as I read it? So, these are some of the ideas. We'll be looking more at another top 10 on actually how to study the Bible in detail. But here we're just thinking about taking advantage of what God is telling us in the passage in an orderly way, in a methodical way. And number eight, make connections. Yeah, now that's an area of expertise. I think uh, you have, you've led college Bible studies for some years and these ideas are really helpful. Maybe you could just enlighten us on that. Well, in the College Bible Study, we make three forms of connections. The first is text to text. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, based on the truth that the Bible is a whole body of truth. 
the different components of the Bible fit together, and so we should expect for the text you're studying to connect with other portions of the Bible. And then the second is text to world, that we know that the Bible is practical, that even though uh, it was written thousands of years ago, it still has to do with the world around us today. And then mm -hmm. finally, text to self, that the Bible is applicable and it should have to do with my own life personally, that if, like you said with George Mueller, that as I read the Bible, it should change me. I should be uh, prayerful through that experience. Great. Those are like skeletons, and we have the privilege of sort of putting the meat on the bones. So following those diagnostic tools can help us get a lot more out of the passage. And number nine is to ask questions. We all know this, that sometimes when people begin to study the Bible, they say, I don't have any questions. But it's not too long until we develop this habit of asking good questions. You don't get good answers unless you ask the right questions. So who is the author, if we know? And what is the main theme of the book? And are there commands to obey in this section? Are there promises to claim? What does it teach me about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit? about salvation, about Christian living, and so on. So having a little list of questions like that in the back of my Bible, when I get a bit stuck on a passage, just ask those questions, and before long, I'll start to get some good answers from those questions. Whenever someone in the Bible study says they don't have any questions, I say they're there, you just have to find them. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and number 10, stick as much as possible to the passage you're studying. You know, if you take a tangent of a tangent of a tangent, it's not too long until you're going in circles. And once in a while we discover a truth that leads us into a rich field of study and we ought to follow it. But we shouldn't just follow all the rabbit trails because when I pick up an idea in this passage that may be secondary to the main theme, and then I start to follow that one, and that leads to another. It's like wandering in the forest, and I've lost the path, and I have no idea where I'm going. So one thing I suggest is having a little notebook and keep it as a kind of granary. You remember how Joseph in Egypt, during the good years, he stored away for the lean years. And sometimes when we're studying the Bible, we kind of get stuck like, I, I'm not sure where to study. And if you have this little book, where you put a paragraph down, make sure you write enough so you can remember the idea. But if you're studying a passage and you say, well, there, Melchizedek, I really ought to study Melchizedek sometime, maybe not today because it'll take me away from the main theme, but put down a little paragraph there. I want to study who was Melchizedek and how does he relate to Christ. And then later on when I'm a bit dry and I need something to stimulate my thinking, I can go back to my granary and say, now there's something that I really ought to study and it'll give me a boost. So it's not that we don't study these things, but we don't want to bounce off one thing and then another and never accomplish anything like the man in Ichabod train who jumped on his horse and rode off in all directions. We want to have a path and follow that path. So by all means, when we think about Bible study, we can maximize it. We can use the time efficiently. Some people say, look, I'm sorry, I don't have three hours a week. Well, God doesn't ask for what we don't have, but what we do have. Do you have 20 minutes? It's amazing what God could show you in 20 minutes a day. As you ask him to show you, and as you read carefully, and as you observe, and as you draw conclusions, and as you make careful notes, it's amazing what you could do in 20 minutes a day. So by all means, get into the Word of God and use some help, some study helps, some techniques to maximize, to get the most out of your study. And God will richly not only bless you, but bless others as well. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 15, meditate on these things. That means run it back and forth through your mind. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, that is, apply what you're learning. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. 
you can have an influence for good on others in saving them from wasted life, bad decisions, etc., etc. If you're in the Word, learning it and living it, you can have an influence for good on others as well.